Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here, and if you're new to Mental Dental, welcome to the channel. In this video, we're going to unpack all of the latest information on the INBDE, or the Integrated National Board Dental Exam. All of the information in this video is available for free from the official ADA website, and since this is a new exam, things may be liable to change at a later date. So the INBDE is set to replace both NBDE Part 1 and Part 2, and it will start to be administered officially on August 1st, 2020. Now at the time of recording this video, that's in just a few days. Part 1 will be discontinued the day before on July 31st, 2020. Part 2 will be discontinued two years later on July 31st, 2022. So a big question people ask me is, should I take part one and part two, or should I wait and plan to take the INBDE? Well, it depends mostly on where you're in your dental education. So part one is traditionally taken during winter break of your second year, although it can be taken earlier in the summer of first year, and others opt to take it later, like during the summer of their second year. So obviously, if you're watching this video and have not taken or past part one yet, or are doing so very soon, plan on taking the INBDE. However, if you've already taken and passed part one, you have until July 31st, two years from now, at least when this video is being recorded, to pass part two. So my recommendation is if you've already passed part one, I would definitely plan to continue that progress and take part two. However, if you've passed part one and can't pass part two before this date, then you would have to take the INBDE. As far as when to take the INBDE during dental school, it depends on your individual curriculum and preference, but I would shoot for summer break after your third year for your first attempt, which allows for the winter break during your fourth year as a second attempt if needed. So a little bit more about the exam. It's actually been planned since 2009, so the Joint Commission on National Dental Examinations has been working on this for quite some time. The impetus behind this exam is a combination of events, mostly changes in dental school curricula and accreditation standards, and focusing less on spitting out facts and more about thinking like a dentist and how to practice safely and responsibly. So this exam attempts to take all of dental school and put it into one exam. Now the reason I say attempt is it's impossible to take that much information and test all of it in just 500 questions, but this is the best attempt to do so. Speaking of which, there are 500 total questions on the exam compared to a total of 900 questions from before if you count 400 from part one and 500 from part two. It also consists of two days of test taking with 12 and a half hours total. So structurally, this exam is identical to part two in terms of duration of the exam and the total number of questions. Good news is that now there's only one exam that you need to take. The bad news is there's a lot more content to cover. So the INBDE removes the ability to memorize questions. The NBDE has test banks and remembered questions, but this integrated exam has freshly written items and relies more so on critical thinking rather than just rote memorization. But what I will tell you is that high yield facts are not going away and they will, they will still dominate your decision making and play a very important role in this exam as well. For a more detailed breakdown of the schedule, here is a look at that, again, from the ADA website. So in terms of scoring of the exam, it is pass-fail. The amount of uh, questions that you need to get correct is currently unclear because the test has not been officially administered at the time of recording this video. In terms of how many attempts you have to take the exam, that total is five. This is the same for part one and part two. You're allowed five total attempts 
to pass the integrated board exam, and these are separate from any attempts that you've had on part one or part two. So if you failed either of those, or maybe you failed five times, you can still take this new exam and you have five times to do so. The retest policy is a bit confusing, but here are the basics. You have to wait a minimum of 90 days between failed attempts, and you must wait at least one full year after the third failed attempt in order to try again. Now my hope is that I'll prepare a library of videos and other resources for you so that you can pass on your first time and you don't have to worry about any of this. Now note that these rules are subject to change in the next year or so as they figure things out. I'll leave a link in the description below for a more detailed look at the retest policy if you're interested. All right, now to the good stuff. So if you've watched my part two videos, I split my series up by specialty area. So prosthodontics, orthodontics, oral pathology, etc. For the INBDE, the breakdown is completely different and frankly, very confusing. So the best way to think of it is instead of being broken down into singular categories, so those being endo, operative, practice management, this test can be broken down into dual categories. So every single question will belong to two categories. So any given question on the exam will belong to at least one of these three clinical content areas and at least one of these 10 foundation knowledge areas. If we want to get even more complex, there are actually 56 unique clinical content subcategories within these three. Now you can read through all 56 of those on their website, and a lot of it is common sense. You must be able to interpret patient data, uh, be able to prevent, diagnose, and manage caries and periodontal disease, and it nicely lists out the competencies that should be expected of an entry-level general dentist. But it also mentions things like oral surgery, pros, endo, perio, and interestingly, just reading through them, it looks like there's a little less emphasis on certain specialties like orthodontics and pediatric dentistry compared to what we saw in part two. And then we have the foundation knowledge areas, and they're a bit more concrete. So these are like biochemistry and pharmacology, ethics, physiology, pathology, although there is some overlap between these 10 categories. So really, you're left with clinical sciences from part two and scientific disciplines from part one, and then combine both of these mindsets to make this exam. I think honestly the best way to tackle the exam in terms of studying is to focus on the concrete categories and things we know that the examiners are going to be testing on. And so the study material that I'll produce for this exam will do just that. So the actual questions on the INBDE come in two distinct forms. Kind of like before, we have standalone questions. So these are kind of out of context, multiple choice questions. You have four or five choices to pick from. That's gonna be the majority of them at 300. And you'll also get item set questions. So item set questions are a little bit different. Now for the INBDE, there's no requirement that each set of questions in these item set questions are going to be given a full set of records. So in the part two exam, you'd have case questions, you'd have a hundred of them, and you'd be given a patient, you'd be given their chart, full set of radiographs, photographs, all of these sorts of uh, stimulus materials. And in this exam, you're only going to be given those materials that you absolutely need to answer the question. You're not going to be given a full set of records. You're also going to have more of these kinds of questions, so 200 item set questions for the INBDE. Now, these questions will have will be grouped in uh, three to six, so that's going to be three to six questions pertaining to a single patient. They will contain a patient box. We'll talk more about what that means, and it may contain other materials like photographs, x-rays, lab reports, charts, drawings, or prescriptions. Now you might notice I also have the patient box up here, 
And that's another big difference for the INBDE is that these standalone out of context questions might also include a patient box. The, so you'll get some patient information and that's only going to pertain to that singular question. And again, it seems like all of the multiple choice questions on this exam, of course, all of them are multiple choice and all of them will have about four, uh, four to five question, uh, answers to pick from. So you're either gonna get A through D or A through E. All right, so I want you guys to get really familiar with the patient box. Now this is unique to the INBDE and it's perhaps the biggest thing that we'll get accustomed to seeing. In the vast majority of questions you get, you'll get a patient box that always tells you the same information every time. So we really can learn this and memorize what this is going to look like. And again, this can be used in both the standalone questions and the item set questions. So the first section of this patient box, there are four sections, and the first one is always going to be labeled patient. It's required, you're always gonna see this if you have a patient box, and it's gonna list the patient's gender, their age, and sometimes their ethnicity. The second section is the chief complaint. This one is also required, so you're gonna see this in every question that has a patient box as well. This one's going to list the main symptom or symptoms or the patient's reason for seeking dental care. It oftentimes is listed as a direct quotation from the patient directly or their guardian if they're a younger child, for instance. The third section is the background and or patient history. This one might be left blank, but usually it's not. Now it's going to contain a bunch of information if it's there it's going to have um, history of medical conditions, current med medications that they might be taking, the history of dental diagnoses and treatment, any allergies, and then social history such as tobacco use, their occupation, maybe if they're a geriatric patient, what their living arrangements are, things like that. And then current findings will be the fourth section. This one might also be left blank, but usually it's not. And the data here, would be provided by a dental professional during the current visit. So these are things that your dental assistant would record when the patient comes in and then let you know about before you see the patient. So this could be things like height and weight, vital signs, so blood pressure, glucose level, uh, the results of any diagnostic tests that they did, like a cold test, percussion test, something like that, uh, the assessment of patient condition, and that's going to be really important, so that might tell you if there's swelling or lack thereof, if there are any sites of bleeding, um, what their uh, jaw function might be in terms of maximum opening, for instance, what a tooth might look like if it's discolored, uh, things like that. So that's the patient box, and I actually really like this because it's standardized. It's a thing that we can study and learn and get used to and it clearly presents information, and it's very similar, again, to how a dental assistant might present a patient to you, particularly in a limited exam situation. Now, most of the practice questions and things that I will come up with for the INBDE will include this patient box, so you can get really used to seeing it and learning how to use it. Speaking of which, here is a practice question that I came up with. And so here's our example question from the INBDE. Go ahead and pause the video. I'll let you read through the patient box and the question, think through the answer choices, go have some fun with this, and then we'll reconvene and talk about the answer. All right, so this patient is a child of 11 years old. She comes in with the parent telling you that her front tooth is discolored. They don't know what happened. They're worried about it. Um, she has some kind of asthmatic condition, it seems like. She's taking a Singular once per day, albuterol as a rescue inhaler. And then her tooth number nine, as we can see in the attached picture. So this is, again, we're not getting a full set of records here. We just have one picture to look at. And it has a facial discoloration, this yellow-brown area. And the clinical exam that uh, the dental professional had conducted shows that no other teeth have been affected. 
And the question here, let's just say this is a standalone question, or perhaps this is part of an item set where you have like three to six questions you have to answer about this patient. And one of those is which of the following is the most likely cause of the discoloration on tooth number nine? So we have four answer choices to pick from, and let's go through each of these one at a time. So excessive fluoride ingestion during tooth formation. Well, that's a fancy way of saying fluorosis, and fluorosis will affect multiple teeth that are developing at the same time. So you'd see a band of white or brown or a mottled appearance of these teeth. But you see them across multiple teeth, especially on the contralateral tooth that we would assume is been developing at the same time. So that doesn't seem all that likely as the most likely cause. For B, inherited disorder of tooth formation. Well, inherited disorder makes me think of amelogenesis imperfecta or dentinogenesis imperfecta. Again, that's a systemic issue and that's going to affect the entire dentition, not just one isolated tooth. So that one doesn't seem very likely either. For C, systemic effects of asthma on the development of the tooth. Now again, we have systemic. Systemic makes me think multiple teeth are going to get infected. And asthma isn't really going to affect the development of teeth. Now you might be using an inhaler a lot, which could cause dry mouth, increasing your caries risk, you get increased acid erosion risk. But again, systemic means multiple teeth are being affected. It doesn't make sense that just one tooth would stand out from the rest in that case. So we're left with D, trauma or infection to a primary tooth. And so that would be like you fell and hit the primary tooth that was developing or that was in the mouth while this permanent tooth was developing underneath it. And so, you know, if you have some kind of trauma, it's most likely going to affect a front tooth and that certainly could interfere with dental development of the permanent tooth, say during apposition of enamel. And this actually has a name, and it's called Turner's hypoplasia. And Turner's hypoplasia, which is often concentrated to one or two front teeth that are affected by an accident as a child or an infection to a primary tooth, that is exactly what we're seeing here and what they're describing over here. So the answer for this item set question is D. So you can see how we still use high yield facts, but instead of just, um, you know, instead of just spitting out some information and memorizing certain uh, terms or how questions are worded, we take the role of a general dentist with a patient in the chair, not a student sitting behind a computer. So in some ways, I think it's more fun. It gives it some more context, but at least it's certainly more clinically relevant. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what to expect on the exam, how it's being laid out, and how you can expect to study for it. Now, another question I get a lot is what should I be using to study? I'm not sponsored by any of these by any means, but just from personal experience and previous experience, I really like the Dental Board's Mastery app. They have an INBDE uh, app that's available now. It's really great. The Dental Dex, they have an INBDE version. Uh, I heard, I've heard things, people have said they just combine part one and part two Dental Dex into one uh, compilation. Just keep that in mind before buying that. I know some of these are very expensive. So again, I just want to uh, leave that on the table. Uh, Mosby's does not have a book available yet. Hopefully it will be coming in the future. I think their content is always very, very good. And then, of course, my videos. So I plan to make uh, a, a lot of videos for this stuff. I know there's a lot of new information here. It's uh, presented in a whole new context. So I hope to unpack all of that for you and help you get really confident tackling this exam and passing on the first try. So that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for more on dentistry and for the INBDE. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do here, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to all of my patrons here for all their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone, 
and I'll see you in the next video.